In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And now I forgive us the iniquity of our sins. We confess together, O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray thee of thy bounteous mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy loved Son, Jesus Christ. To be gracious and merciful to me. Upon this, our confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God to all of us, and in this stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive us all our sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our intro this morning is from the 119th Psalm. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you, but may not wander from your commands. I have stored up the word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the just decrees in my mouth. In the way of your testimonies I know that. As much as in all my riches, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forgive the word. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Bless our the Lord. Teach me your statutes. We continue with the Kyrie on page 17. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee, we glorify Thee, we give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God, Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Thou that takes away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sits at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy on us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, keep your faith the church continuing in the true faith that, relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, the Son of our Lord, who lives and reigns with the kingdom of every spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the first lesson. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it 
to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is in your insert. Psalm 112. The righteous will never be moved. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. His offspring will be mighty in the land. Generation by the Wealth and riches are in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends. Who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady, he will not be afraid. Until he looks to triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever, his horn is exalted on him. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He now has to speak to him all the way, the desire of our wicked man. Please listen to the reading of the second lesson. city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. 
Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Here ends the gospel. Praise be to you, Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 22, tell me what you believe. I believe we, in one God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and, and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Who for us men, for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and he sits on the right hand of God. He shall come again glory to judge both the wicked and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. soothing, pleasant, orangish glow that makes them work very well for night lights. In today's gospel lesson, the part of the Sermon of the Mount that doesn't make me feel so ashamed, Jesus tells us that we're supposed to be both salt and light. What's more like that than a salt lamp? So why is Jesus as our king telling us to be like a salt lamp. I wonder because without definitive scientific proof, 
people using salt lamps to purify the air reminded me of people who have no belief in Jesus as their Savior wearing a cross or a crucifix. The cross is not a talisman that prevents injury and harm. People may feel better or safer wearing one, but there's no proof in the Bible that indicates wearing a cross really does anything. As a matter of fact, historically, the church didn't adopt the cross as a symbol until the fourth century, well after the Bible was written. I wear one to give off the soothing, warm glow of Jesus and to keep him on people's minds. It's who I believe in, so I wear a symbol to show that, not to induce some sort of supernatural shielding. It's about helping people to focus on Christ rather than thinking it's a magic charm that will chase away evil. But let's not get off the subject here. Let's look at what Jesus meant when he said we should be both salt and light on this earth. Maybe salt is like the law and gospel is like the light. Salt prevents corruption, but only if it stays salty. Light is only useful if it can be seen and not covered up. Both can cause irritation, like salt in the wound or light in the eyes. Let me repeat this. The only Jesus people ever get to see is when they see Jesus in us. So sometimes being salty and helping prevent corruption and shining out as the light of truth helps people. Now I thought this metaphor about salt and light was Jesus' introduction to what comes next in the Sermon on the Mount. But according to most scholars, it's not. They say Jesus is moving from general instructions for all people in the Beatitudes, if you looked at it last week, to instructions for his disciples on how to behave as apostles. Be like salt lamps. And then finally, Jesus' expectations for how we are to behave with each other as a king speaking to the subjects of his kingdom. And that has to do with the law. This starts with our behavior towards anybody, saved or not. It works best if we follow the attitudes. It's kind of a light thing. Next, Paul explains the transition how we are to approach people in general to how we approach them as apostles. He said, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing amongst you except Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I think that means you have to appropriately season your message with the salt of God's truth and the light of his grace. Jesus says the behavior between ourselves as Christians is similar, but the first rule for those saved by the light of the gospel is don't ignore the law or relax it. Make it saltier. We will see this in more detail next week as Jesus makes the law harder to obey. Not with the emphasis on us becoming perfect, but on the perfection of Jesus in the law. He explains this week the gospel does not replace the law it fulfills it. Another part of the law for those who are in the kingdom of heaven is your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. If I understand that correctly, it means we can't mistake our obedience to the law as righteousness, and especially not the type of righteousness that will get us into heaven. That is provided only by Jesus Christ. Only his righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. And God's law says, 
trusting in one who was innocent of breaking the law and sacrificed in our place, imputes his innocence to us. That was true of the Lamb. It's certainly true of the Lamb of God. Now, as king, Jesus is often the opposite of what some have come to believe about his nature. The phrase God of the Old Testament usually means the Heavenly Father and has come to mean an angry, vindictive God of laws. The God of the New Testament, called Jesus, is called the God of love and the gospel. Jesus, again, is half law and half gospel. As the newly appointed king of the universe, do we suppose he's going to be less himself? I don't think so. Just as mercy cannot be mistaken for weakness in a king, loving gospel forgiveness cannot be assumed to be a weak replacement for the law. It is the fulfillment of the law, and it's based on punishment. Fulfillment is defined by the online Oxford Dictionary as the achievement of something desired, promised or predicted, and the meaning of a requirement or condition. The word we translate as fulfillment from Greek means to make full or complete. Complete or filling the law doesn't sound like it's being discarded. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm advocating legalism. Remember what the point is here. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the law. We appeal to God through Jesus as our advocate to judge us under the rules of the whole law, including that little proviso that allows us to be forgiven because he perfectly fulfilled the law. And we trust him to cover our sins with his perfection and take our full punishment. Our best efforts just don't make it. From the Old Testament, why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I chose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? We need to be more like the second half of that reading. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness and undo the straps of the yoke? to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Isn't that exactly what God did when he was revealed in human form as Jesus? Our best sacrifice is imitating him by being nice and helping other people. This is not limited to other Christians. We do this by being salt lamps amongst ourselves. But be beware that if you don't let the light of Christ shine out of us, we become too salty. Without light to heat and dry, the average salt lamp absorbs water from the very air it's supposed to cleanse and starts to disintegrate. A salt lamp without light is worth worse than useless it erodes and destroys everything around it. It's okay to be salty, but not if you're just wrecking everybody that gets close to you. When we focus just on the laws of Jesus' nature, we become lightless salt lamps and help no one. On the other hand, without the salt, a salt lamp is just another nightlight. Sure, it can help you to see, but without the salt to soften the light, it can blind. Focusing too much on love blinds us, so we trip over the law. Verses 1 and 2 of our Old Testament lesson 
were omitted this morning. They say, cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Salty and illuminating together in balance are a good thing. Just one or the other is not helpful to our king because it doesn't help him to purify or to show people the way to go. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, be in your hearts and in your minds. Please join me for the offertory on page 12. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me thy Holy Spirit. Amen. Healing God, remember our sick, especially Alice, Autumn, Cal, Carol, Carolyn, Diane, Dolores, Don, Elvira, John, Linda, Liz, Paul, and Rebecca, and those who have suffered loss, especially the families in Springfield. Place your loving hands of healing on them and bring wholeness of life. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Good Shepherd, lead your church throughout the world to follow your example, bringing the good news to the whole world, even if it means being nice to everyone and behaving ourselves, so we make good reflections of you. Lord, your mercy. Yeah. Prince of Peace, bring your peace to our fallen world, especially we pray for those in areas ravaged by natural disasters and man-made suffering through war. We also pray for those in our surrounding community that they may join with us in worshiping you so that all may serve you in peace. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. ruler of the universe, send your spirit upon all the leaders of this world so that they feel compelled to follow your perfect example, serving humankind rather than desiring to be served. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. these and all other things we bring before you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right to you. It is truly good, proper, and healing that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord, Lord God, God of heaven, heaven and earth, and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, 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 Lord Jesus Christ, in the same night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this as often as you eat in remembrance of me. The same way. 
Take a cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We say together the Agnes Day. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. O Christ, Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, grant us thy peace. have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people in Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Well, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this healing gift. And we beg you of your mercy that you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, Lord, without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Blessed be the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the Lord bless and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.